The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. I am the host, Andy Steele, and tonight we're going to be talking about a lot of the cool things AE 9-11 Truth is doing, and we're sort of going to be reintroducing uh, tonight's guest. He's been on the show back in the audio days, but this is his first time, prime time on camera. We're going to be learning more about him. His name is Kamal Obeid. He is a board member for AE 9-11 Truth. He holds a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He has been a practicing civil engineer in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1980 and a licensed structural engineer since 1985. During his career, he has served as an engineer of record on many building design and retrofit projects. He specializes in structural steel building analysis as well as investigating structural failures of steel frame buildings. Very relevant to our topic. And at one point, he served as a volunteer for the Office of Emergency Services. That's FEMA. He was investigating earthquake failures. Uh, he's a longtime member of the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, and he has served on several of its code and business forum committees. This is Kamal Obey. Let's bring him on in. Kamal, welcome hey, back. Thank you. To nice to be here. Oh, thank you. And I just want to tell you, right before we started recording today, I went and put my arm on the arm uh, of the chair, and it broke off. Oh, so no. I just want to give oh, a warning to the audience. I'm still not used to it. My equilibrium is all screwed up. So if I put my arm here and start to fall off the chair, oh, no. that is what is going now. on. Things are going great, and they're only getting better. <laughs> but uh, your first time here on the show when it's on video, Tell us a little bit more about your engineering background. Oh my! <laughs> what? Where can I? What can I say? In addition to what your your introduction was awesome, it, it made me sound more important than I really am. But um, anyway, uh, well, you know, I've been I've been in the business for quite a while, uh, as longer than I'd like to admit. Uh, started back in 1980 as a practicing engineer and. Throughout the years, I've done so many different projects. There are just uh, uh, a variety of things. I mean, I, I have uh, at one time in my, in my career, I, I focused on steel frame buildings, uh, a lot of analyses, mainly for seismic, for for uh, earthquake design, and um, also for building failures. Uh, back in 1994, I uh, traveled to Los Angeles to look at the damage due to the Northridge earthquake that happened back then. And at that time, there were a lot of steel frame building failures, which uh, actually was interesting enough because uh, the codes at that time were thought to be bulletproof as far mm -hmm. as designing steel frame buildings. But then what happened is that all the, these buildings, some of these connections were failing miserably. Uh, back then, um, and, uh, and and so the codes had to be rewritten re for that. So uh, a lot of the analysis that that uh, basically um, came after that, that I was involved with, uh, had to do with looking at steel frame connections, how they fail, and uh, you know designing connections not to fail, so that um, buildings uh, can be what's called ductile. They, uh, steel frame buildings can behave ductily as opposed to brittly, which in other words, they don't, steel frame buildings are supposed to behave in such a way that they twist and bend and all kinds of things, but they don't break. They don't uh, rupture uh, too uh, readily. So that's the whole point of that. And, and then when, of course, when I looked at uh, building seven, that's when I first 
got involved with AE 911 Truth, uh, Richard uh, Gage asked me to um, help him with an interview with BBC at that time. And we looked at, uh, I studied Building, Building 7 to basically, um, and I studied the, the report that was put out by NIST at that time to see if, you know, what, they, what they've done and if, if it had any merit. And, um, you know, st the steel building obviously is, uh, is uh, you know, it's a 40 story plus building, um, supposed to be behaving ductily. And we talked about ductile frames. And so when the building fails, uh, it can't just crumble. Okay. So uh, likewise, the, the towers uh, too, but that's a little more complicated situation. But so, um, so, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the NIST, uh, NIST study, and I pointed that out, uh, you know, looking at the various different uh, stages of failure of the building uh, that they, they uh, postulated that, uh, you know, the, the, how the initiating event and how it started failing and all these things, every one of those uh, hypotheses that they came up with was completely wrong. And then, uh, of course, what really uh, the, the proof in the pudding is, you know, the, the model that they basically uh, developed, the, the three-dimensional model, a beautiful model. And they had it, uh, you know, supposedly they were saying, okay, this model is now failing, and they showed it to you, and, and what's, what's happening instead, instead of coming down the way it actually came down, it's, it's really crumpling like a little soda can. And that's ductility for you. So that's that's you know how steel frame buildings behave if you had failed all the insides of the building, which was not uh, likely in any case. So the crumpling of the outside of the building, they, they, that's where they stopped their their analysis. Uh, so you know, I mean, from that point on, I, I got really, um, you, you know, I. I felt an obligation to basically, um, you know, work on this, on this, uh, with, with AE and I know the truth, because obviously something's wrong there. And, and so I, I basically dedicated a lot of my time to it and then, you know, joined, uh, more in, uh, more in earnest back in 2018 when, uh, you know, they were asking to, to bring more engineers on the board, so I joined the board at that time, and so that's yeah, how it, I get to be today. I was just going to say, engineers are the people that make the buildings continue to stand. You know, you're from San Francisco; it is a crazy city. Now, some people might think I'm saying that for other reasons. I'm just talking physically. I mean, I didn't drive that much there, but I had to drive somebody to some appointment at one point, and I saw that the streets, they just slant right down. You hit yeah. the brakes, and you're still rolling. It's a little yeah. terrifying if you're not used to it. And I'm looking to the side of me, and these houses are going up the hill slanted. And I'm like, what engineer or who had to design these houses to uh, be on this terrain here. And of right. course you have the earthquake situations, you have a lot of earthquakes out there in the area. I remember listening to a radio broadcast warning that the big one is gonna hit someday and nobody's prepared for it. Um, I'm not in the San Francisco Bay Area anymore, but uh, for you guys out there, that's something to be concerned about. So you have to know what you are doing to be an engineer out in that particular part of the country. And everything you are describing with Building 7 the fact that their models cannot replicate what really happened in the real world and then they cut the animation off as the building starts to turn on itself. They don't even go through the full uh, collapse of it. Everything screams for the need for a new investigation, but here we still are 22 years later uh, having to rabble rouse and do all of the work necessary to just even bring, keep attention on this important issue. I'm curious, you said when you saw Building 7, a lot of people say they saw it on the day of. I did, I didn't think anything much of it because I was still in shock and awe that day. It took years for me to uh, have it pointed out that that doesn't make any sense. Did you see it on the day of September 11th? How long did it take for you to be awakened to this issue? Well, that's a very, very good point. You know, I, I basically, from the very, very beginning, I figured there was something wrong with this picture. Uh, but uh, I was just too wrapped up 
and other things at that time. And I, um, you know, just basically peripherally kind of talked to other engineers and attended uh, several different seminars that the, you know, Structural Engineers Association had at that time to basically, and it was interesting because all they were doing at that time is proving uh, the official story. So I don't know, now that I think back of, of it, I think it was just a little too much overcompensation, no questioning of the of whether that official story was correct. Now th this is of course before the NIST reports came out. So it was like, you know, within a week after the failure of those buildings, and I actually volunteered, I wanted to go out there and uh, inspect the steel to look at the, the, the I, I was just so curious for my own professional education, not necessarily, I wasn't questioning anything so much at that time, but I just really wanted to understand how these buildings failed. So I put in an application to, uh, I don't remember it was FEMA or whatever, the, the, the uh, organization, there was, there was a, uh, an organized group that was going out there from the Structural Engineers Association and I applied for that and I was, uh, I was not accepted at that time. Uh. But the interesting thing, of course, is that, um, you know, then, then you find out uh, not too... Uh, not too late after that, that the steel was gone. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I would have loved to look at that steel. I would have loved for my colleagues to look at that steel and, and basically take some samples, reassemble the building, you know, just like you, you do when, when um, air, airplane disasters occur. The, uh, you know, the uh, uh, FAA, uh, the, uh, they, they want to uh, wanna, would want to assemble, reassemble the entire plane in a huge warehouse to see how this thing, you know, what happened exactly. None of that was done in this case. And this is a major situation, a major building failure. How could it not be done? How could, how could the steel be disappeared? Why? I mean, we, for the sake of science, at least preserve some major components of that steel. So uh, these are the things that basically started kind of brewing in my mind and became more and more disturbing over the years um, as you realize that, that this, you know, nobody's talking about this. And then when you talk to your colleagues, I talked to my colleagues at that time, say something's wrong with this picture. And, and you know, they would all agree. They would all agree there's something wrong. It looks like control, and some of the very prominent structural engineers that I know in the San Francisco Bay Area, I used to, Work with them on the on this uh, the uh, some committees at, at the Structural Engineers Association, and so I know them, the principals of these firms, and uh, several of them just did not want to deal with us. But they did, did did agree at that time that it looks like controlled demolition. But um, you know, and then of course once I got more involved with with AE nine eleven Truth, I, I attempted to contact. My friends again and did not get much of a response. They did not want to deal with this issue. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to say why, but just, you know, it's just disturbing that um, such prominent, smart structural engineers do not want to relook at this issue, even though they what? have doubts about the official story. Well, I have a friend who turned into, well, not a friend anymore, but at the time back then, uh, a friend who turned into a very important engineer person who at one point uh, admitted that uh, we have a point. Uh, that was all I could get from her. But at the time when I first started waking up to this, she was an intern at some engineering company. And I was I was not committed to this at all yet. I just, you know, I just went, I had questions. And uh, and she said, well, we got a, we got a speech on why the towers came down. I know why they came down. I'm like, well, tell me. Like, I want to know. I wasn't in fully involved with AE. I wasn't even involved with AE at that point. And the answer I got was, well, I don't have to explain anything to you. So there was elusiveness <laughs> even going on within the engineering profession. Uh, people who, you know, should know, should question, just didn't want to touch this. And to this day, we still deal with this issue. They agree with oh, us. Yeah. We see this. We see this out in the presentations that our engineers are giving. People will give a standing ovation. They will agree that nobody challenges the findings that we're bringing, but it is such a hot potato 
for so many, not just in the political ring, uh, ring but also uh, in the engineering profession. Just don't want to uh, muddy their reputations with this, even if it is factual. And that is a major issue that we are taking on in our own way, uh, giving the presentations at various professional chapters around the country, trying to get this message out, not just to engineers, but to people in the general public, people in the political realm, everywhere that we possibly can to get uh, the evidence out there. And so many people, oh God, I hear this all the time now because there's been so many things that have happened and you know, history marches on. Uh, they'll say, oh, it was 22 years ago. You know, it's a dead issue. We've got other things going on. But at the same time, I watch true crime shows where some mom will be searching for justice for her murdered daughter. And it may have happened 40 years ago and she'll be an yeah. old lady, but eventually they catch the guy, DNA or whatever. And, uh, and there's closure, and it's a, a very important story, and we hear about it on the news. So justice continues no matter how much time passes because those 3,000 people, near close to 3,000 people that died on September 11th, they are not here right now. There's 22 years of life that they were gypped out of, and that is just putting it mildly for doing nothing other than going to work that day. And it's because those towers came down, mostly. Um, a lot of them were killed. Of course, some were killed in the airplane impacts too. But our issue is relevant, and also it's relevant for the people uh, that died as a result of the toxins at Ground Zero. Those toxins were put in the air because the towers came down. So, as somebody that is very involved, I see how involved you are day to day, and you sit on our board as well. How do you stay passionate? How do you withstand all of those negative Nancys out there that tell you, come on, let it go, put it in the past. Even if you're right, it doesn't matter anymore. What's your answer to that? What a good question. I grapple with this every day. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder what I'm doing here. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, uh, I, it's such an important issue, not only uh, to the victims that suffered that day, but to many, many, it had so many re re repercussions around the world, and we're still suffering as a result of, of uh, you know, 9-11 and, and the change in the paradigm of, you know, wars and, you know, fighting terrorism or whatever that means. So it, it, it's gotten to be such a huge issue, and to this day, it is still so important. If one is passionate about justice, if one is passionate about human rights, if one is passionate about uh, saving this world from a, a, a potential nuclear holocaust, um, you, we must go on. We must keep inspired. We must. This is such an important issue that cannot be forgotten. Um, I can't. I mean, for me personally, I feel it's something that that I must do for my own conscious uh, consciousness. I mean, I just, I just uh, to to. I mean, I want to basically. Not go through life personally and, 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 and thinking that I haven't done anything about this. I don't know what I'm doing right now either. I mean, we it just it's such a difficult uphill battle, basically fighting the the uh, the official story and, and basically trying to get colleagues who are in the same business, uh, structural engineers, uh, to actually pay attention to this issue. It, it is such an uphill battle because. Like you said, people just want to move on. Uh, but then again, how can you move on when all this turmoil is going on, where, where, where this, this whole world that, that became such a mess as a result of 9-11? So that's, that's how I, I see it. I see this as one of the most noble things that anybody that's out there in any kind of capacity of activism should be doing. Look, there's a lot of people who've been distracted by the left-right stuff, or things going on. Obviously, we you know watch the news and follow it uh, and have our own opinions, but I love the fact that we keep them to ourselves. In fact, I tell people when I first meet them, I don't want to know what you think about Trump. Don't tell me. I don't care. Just keep it out because I just want to focus on uh, first the person that I'm dealing with, who, who they are and what, they, uh, you know, what their essence is, but also just on our issue. There's something so noble about that to me, the fact that we keep on pushing on with just the facts of September 11th, keep beating the drum on this, and we don't get distracted 
by all of that nonsense going on on the outside because somebody needs to talk about this. And, you know, they want to paint us out there in the, the mainstream media as these obsessives, you know, like these people with these, uh, oh, those these cork boards. You know, every time I see a, quote, conspiracy theorist portrayed in, uh, in, in fictional TV shows, they always have some cork board with yarn and everything. I've never had one of those. I've, it must be something that... Uh, I, I didn't get uh, issued, but uh, but you know they think it's obsessive. But then you know I'll watch uh, lectures by Yale professors uh, who focus their entire study for ten years on something like the Garfield assassination, right? Very interesting because you hear so much about Kennedy and Lincoln and so much focus on that. But we had two other presidents who were assassinated. And you don't hear much out there in movies and such. But this I watched this lady and she knows everything about it. And that's celebrated, you know, she wrote a book about it. So there are people that study important events in history and there's nothing wrong with keeping that focus. And of course, the, the main issue that they have with us is that we're focusing on this hugely controversial issue. They wanna tell you it's not controversial, but there's enough holes in the official story uh, to put the whole thing in question. And uh, we point out the irregularities. We point out the obvious evidence that we were lied to about why these buildings came down. To me, the case for controlled demolition was made, God, 10 years ago. Everything else now that comes out is just icing on the cake. And justice is long overdue. And I got a feeling, folks, talking to the audience out there, that something's going to happen. There's going to be some development, some way, even if it doesn't happen this year, it could happen in the next couple of years. Something is going to refocus attention on this issue again you just got to stick with something long enough and then history has, has a way of cycling around and, and making it the important thing once more um so just stay the course you know take a break a little bit if you need to for personal reasons if uh if they come up but keep your mind in the game and at some point our time will come and we will seize on it now, Kamal, talk about some of the challenges that you see the movement facing. I just outlined some of them. I think it's a, it's just a societal and mental uh, challenge uh, that we try to uh, deal with in terms of you know the, the passing of time and new issues coming up. What are some of the challenges that you see us facing 22 years later? Well, I mean, I, I think um, the, the question is, is, are we losing focus on a key issue that brought us here today. So people are, are, mo are moving on to some extent, looking at the current situation, uh, worried about certain things that are happening now, that when you look at it in, in, some, in some way, it's really all connected. There, there is such a huge connection, as I just said earlier, between you know, the wars that are taking place right now and 9-11. And, and it's just, so important not to lose sight of that. Uh, so that, that, I mean, that's the big challenge is the current situation. Things are happening now, but they're happening, you know, they're all, you know, because you know, there, there's some connection there, uh, it, it's important not to lose focus. However, uh, it's easy to actually get swept up in, you know, in, in the, with the economy, for example, people, uh, losing their jobs. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, uh, companies here in the, in the Bay Area are laying off right and left. Uh, technology companies are laying off people. Um, the economy isn't as solid as the stock market looks. Uh, just people, there, there's, some, there, there's some disconnect between what is happening uh, you know, people making profits on the one side in the stock market or, you know, companies are, are accumulating wealth and getting more uh, valuable uh, uh, versus the regular person who is either losing their job or, you know, barely making it. And so a lot of people are, are struggling with life. And, and I can understand how it will be a challenge to basically be wanting to keep pushing on a, on an issue that that you know happened you know, 22 23 years 22 years ago so um i mean i can understand where people are coming from uh this is at some point after 22 years people have to focus on their own lives and, and worry about what's important to them 
how to support their families, how to um, accumulate enough uh, fun, uh, you know, you know, means to to retire for the baby boomers. <laughs> you know, so it's it's just uh, I, I mean I, I do understand the challenges, but yet it is so important not to lose focus because everything is so connected and. Um, you know, a lot of people on the board are are uh, engineers now, and uh, you you know that the, uh, the ret- a lot of people are retired on the board, and it, it's really a wonderful way to, to spend your time, an important way to spend your time on a mission that is so important. So I applaud my colleagues who are uh, on the board who've dedicated their lives to. Uh, to, to this mission, um, so I, you know, I don't know. I've been kind of going on, off on a tangent here, but um, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Well, I understand exactly what you're talking about. <clears throat> when you support AE 911 Truth, you support us keeping the lights on on this issue because everything you're saying is correct. I see it for myself. People do have to worry about their personal lives. First, you can't you can't save the world if your own house is not in order, and so I do advise people to uh, to worry about yourself first. But if you can help us uh, keep the lights on on this issue, keep on pushing for a new investigation, I got a feeling at some point something's going to happen. It always happens in history. Things are going to open up for us. You know, the Soviet Union fell, and uh, now there's TV shows on in Russia about all the atrocities of the Soviet Union. I used to watch them when I was in the Peace Corps in Uzbekistan. I had a friend who got Russian TV. Go to his house, drink some beers, and uh, and watch the good television <laughs> from there. And, yeah, they'd have shows that talked about stuff that Stalin did. All of this out right out in the open, you know, because things changed in Russia. A different climate came in, and, uh, and they could talk about it. I got a feeling the same thing is going to happen here with September 11th, but you know, you go to Dairy Queen, it's a, a medium cup of, uh, what do they call it, a blizzard? It's for a medium cup, $8, $8. Now what if you got a family of four and you wanna take them to the movies and ice cream afterwards? I mean, you're talking close to 100 bucks here. They're making life so hard for the average person to just, you know, just to do things. So most people stay at home and watch television or they stare at their screens and, you know, good God, we know the the kind of stuff that's coming from those screens. Actually, this is going to lead into my next uh, question for you because we put out an article recently about our comments disappearing from YouTube. Uh, we interviewed Zach Voorhees last time we had this show uh, about the censorship taking place at Google. We know what's going on. You type in 911 Truth, most of the stuff is either you know claiming to debunk us or it's uh, some zany nonsense about no planes hitting the towers. They say it was a Disney cartoon or whatever. It's all out there to discredit us and um, try to make us look bad. And then if you want to find the real information, you got to go like 60 pages back. And maybe there will be a video of Niels Herrett from 2010 or something there if you're lucky. That's on Google. The problem is most people use Google, and that's what they know of. Um, So that is a challenge that we are facing is just somehow the algorithm is getting stronger to try to block out the stuff so that, you know, they're not worried about me and Kamal seeing the material. They know that we're already lost to to the system here, Uh, but they don't want new people coming on. They don't want new people coming across this information. So just give me your overall thoughts about that censorship taking place. What do we do to overcome that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, really. You Um, have all the answers. Oh, yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah, my goodness! I uh, it is so disturbing to see this happening uh, progressively, getting uh, more intense as uh, these big companies. We used to we were happy that the internet was such a free, open media, uh, and and it was like the the revenge against the mainstream media, which is just useless. In fact, it's it's more destructive than anything else. So now these big companies who have uh, gained the trust of so many people by appearing to be so open and uh, free, allowing people to post anything they want, and they now are, I don't know how they all got together and decided now to start filtering things and changing things. And this whole thing about fake news, I'm trying to remember when that really started in the in the vernacular, um, you, you know, 
I, I don't remember, you know, what, what, was it before uh, Trump or after Trump or how, how So the, the fake news uh, label has been applied to so many things. And now the fake news for these companies, for the, for the mainstream media, is anything that is deviates from the mainstream narrative is, is labeled as fake news, so it's filtered out. So it's, it's a very disturbing situation. Fortunately, there are other outlets that are still somewhat, I mean, the other communication outlets that are still, I mean, now with the, the uh, hopefully, I, I, I haven't really examined Twitter so much uh, recently, but I'm, I'm hoping it's gonna open up and, and allow a little more free thinking, free thoughts, and and, and uh, uh, alternative information to be presented and, and, and disseminated to the, to the you know, to, to the memberships. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I, I do see this as, as a real problem, uh, not, not only for us, but for democracy, you know, that uh, it, it's when you have the alignment of the media, the government, and uh, the corporations, when they all, you know, kind of in line on, on, on basically uh, quashing free speech and quashing uh, free thinking. Uh, that's that's called fascism, I believe. So I'm I'm hoping we uh, we don't uh, descend into into these depths. Um, in the meantime, I mean, there, there, uh, there, there's some some um, inspiring things that are happening, some um, um, uh, good news, you know, as far as other uh, alternatives to to uh, get the, get the, you know, the truth out. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, you know, and the irony is that, and this is what, just my own observation, is that when all of this started, you know, with the, it started on MySpace for me, but just the push, the challenge against corporate media, uh, the questioning of 9-11, there were very reasonable materials on the internet that people watched. Even, you know, there was the 9-11 truth stuff, but there was other, quote, uh, alternative movements going on that were very reasonable based in fact uh, that the media wanted to call conspiracy theories. And then over time, as it, the internet started to get more neutered, more controlled by the algorithms, the irony here, and I, I believe it's by design, is that crazy stuff that you're, you're allowed to see started getting pushed to the forefront. So people uh, who are not already exposed to alternative information think that alternative information is this zany stuff talking about, you know, aliens from other planets and other such nonsense. That stuff started getting pushed up and the reasonable stuff started getting pushed down. Right, so give this perception that we're we're talking that you know that the majority of 9/11 truth is talking about the crazy stuff, whereas our stuff is backed by evidence. Simply looking for a new investigation. I make sure uh, people that come on my show are very reasonable people, uh, people that our audience should be listening to. And then you've got this uh, phenomenon too that I call the conspiracy industrial complex where you just have sort of people out there who are just trying to make a name for themselves where everything needs to be a conspiracy that happens out there and it just needs a constant flow of, of this in order to keep uh, <laughs> the people viewing and donations coming in. And so we're fighting against that as well. Um, <clears throat> so if somebody appears on this show, it's because I have looked at them and I think that they're valid enough and uh, trustworthy enough and and all of that. But, you know, these are the challenges that we are facing. But the good news is, is that I believe that this stuff will fall, like I have said before, and uh, we keep on fighting and we stay focused on our mission. Now, what I, we're going to have coming out pretty soon, uh, you may have even seen this by the time you watch the show, I say this to the audience, uh, is an article talking about the importance of retaining physical information, all right? The problem with the internet is that things can be controlled. To me, it's almost like magic. I'm not saying that in a literal sense, but sort of, I mean, you know, rather than an incantation by some wizard in a cartoon, you just do some keystrokes and <laughs> change the reality on the computer screen. Um, 
But the physical world is outside of all of that. So it is so important to retain the physical information. You know, could we go to a dystopian Fahrenheit 450 one world where uh, they're trying to burn the books? Who the heck knows at this point? But right now that is impractical. So get your hands on the DVDs, get your hands on the books just in case something happens that makes it even harder for us to be able to share information on the internet. And I want to say this, and I'm going to have you comment on this too as well, uh, Kamal, because I know you're involved in this, but we have a sale going on at the 1811 Truth Store. Everything's 80% off, so it is an opportunity for the supporters out there to get your hands on things uh, that maybe you passed up before because you're like, eh, I don't know, 25 bucks for a book. I don't know if I want to pay that. Well, it's going to be 80% off. So it's basically, you know, I'm not a good mental math guy, but 80% of $25 or 20% of $25, that's what you'd be paying plus some shipping. So this is the best sale that you are going to get. We're transitioning to a new store, a new kind of model. Uh, so it's almost like an eclipse. This doesn't happen very often all right so this is your opportunity to uh get your hands on things and you know what i've been asking people to do for years is a good opportunity to do it if you want to do some kind of activism you're retired don't know what to do get our stuff into the libraries get our stuff into the public libraries then it sits there on the shelf could be five years from now some college kid goes in there bored out of his mind, picks up a book and suddenly wakes up to 9-11, maybe he will be the chosen one. Who knows? <laughs> maybe that person will be the one that figures out how to get some justice on this issue. So it is so important to get our materials out there. This is your opportunity to do it. I used to do that too when I was younger. Just go to the library, find some random corner of it and grab a book. It could be from the 1940s talking about, you know, or 1950s talking about potential nuclear fallout and war between the USSR and USA. I would just read it because it was interesting, some forgotten book. That could happen with our materials too. Uh, so come on, I know that's a mouthful I just threw out there, but talk about the sale, the importance of, of retaining physical information and uh, getting it out there if you can. Well, I think it's a great opportunity not to only buy things uh, for, your, for yourself and your friends, but also to, uh, on sale, we have material that can be disseminated, that can be distributed to, to, uh, to uh, people that have not heard about or have not been thinking about 9-11. Uh, the ideal scenario would be to uh, buy um, multiple of those informational the informational material like cars, DVDs, or and just like you said, Andy, just get it uh, to to libraries, get it to uh, to to church groups, get it to uh, have uh, organize uh, parties with your friends and give them some information, some eye-opening information. That's the whole point of this. It's not only just for us to, I mean, we're trying to basically uh, reduce our inventory because we need to bring in more new stuff. And the new stuff includes uh, many interesting things that are gonna be, we're gonna be putting out for people to, uh, to see and to enjoy and to, to, to use as, as an eye-opening mechanism um, as, as, they, as the word gets around. Um, but I want to give a, a special plug to your book, Andy, the Born of 9-11. I think that's an, a, an amazing uh, a, a work that you put together that, um, you know, for people who enjoy reading and, and uh, a graphic novel, which I think uh, many people do, and especially young people, this will be something, this is something that... That Andy, you put together that is going to turn many, many light bulbs on. I, I can see. Uh, I think it's so important that that gets out as well. So um, that's also a part of the sale, I believe. We have that yep. in there, uh, and and there's going to be a sequel. You can tell us about that, Andy, when you want. Uh, but um, that's going to be, um, you know, going to get people excited as well, especially young people, as I said. Um, that's a good point, and that's going to be coming out, uh, uh, 
yeah, it's uh, Born on 9-11, Summer of Rage. I'm working on it uh, right now. It's a little slow, but it's going to be going out, and we're going to be sending it out. And the story is not slow. I'm just saying my, my work is, and i got to fix the computer that some of the pages are on, too. So uh, um, we're facing many challenges. But, yeah, that we're going to be releasing that uh, at a certain tier level. I think it's – Kamal, you might know better than I do. I think it's either like a $20 tier. We're going to be releasing it digitally the sequel to it we already released the prologue uh a chapter at a time as it's done and then when it's when it's finished we'll have a uh, print on demand version of it and uh, my goal is to try to build an entire sort of like walking dead was in the comic books where you have a just a different series uh new um story arcs come out and we can keep that going for years keep interest in the movement something for people to follow of course it's not the most important thing that we are doing at AE 9-11 Truth right now. I mean, we have Project Due Diligence. We have uh, all of our outreach taking place, but it's just a cool thing for the movement to have and maybe get uh, our information in front of audiences that would have never seen it before. So if you haven't signed up for membership, I mean, sign up for, I believe it's $20. I'd have to look at the bulletin again, but at least at the $20 level, you get those chapters delivered digitally to your inbox so i just wanted to make sure uh we let everybody know that and then we have uh, other we have other things going on at different levels as well so check that out and uh i think we maybe need to republish that bulletin too so people are aware so i, I don't know if i interrupted you there kamal please continue no 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 that's perfect yeah so we, we you know we're coming up with a lot of ideas for things i mean we've done a lot Short of running for Congress, I you know I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure some new idea will come to me. I certainly don't want to do that uh, because I'm afraid I would win. But <laughs> basically, if I ran on the 9/11 Truth oh, issue, oh, yeah. and well, you know, I, I'm afraid because I just don't care about winning and I don't want to be stuck with the job. I'm afraid that that's what would happen to me because I would just go out there and just say what I think and that tends to resonate with people these days. Well, heaven forbid um, people say what they think. <laughs> yeah, true. well, you know, you got a lot of power when you just don't care. And so, you know, um, but th that might be something, but I encourage the supporters to do that, to run for Congress. And, you know, I hear, again, a lot of negative Nancy say Congress would never do anything with this issue. Let's not, you know, well, yeah, as long as you keep yourself out of the game, they won't because all you're going to be getting are these plastic phonies that, uh, you know, do the walk or do the walk and talk the, the corporate talk and get in there. But if you throw yourself into the race and upset the apple cart and speak out about it uh then you know you you can have an impact and, and go there and i'll tell you what if i find at least five people willing to do it i'll do it myself what do you think of that that's awesome well, you know, it's all, all right about, so that, that's the challenge it's all about uh tipping the balance somehow and 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 helping foster a critical mass of uh, free thinker, people doubting 9-11 and, and calling for a new investigation. When does the critical mass happen? It's, it's hard to tell, but it could happen at any time where people just realize that they really have to start doing something about this and they see momentum building up and then it feeds upon itself. Uh, I mean, that's really the hope that this is how change happens over the years where you, you, first you start with a few people just basically calling for uh, justice or whatever it is and then all of a sudden this it snowballs and, and grows and over the years maybe with 9-11 with it takes a few years for people to basically disconnect themselves emotionally uh, from from that story and look at it rationally instead and and basically uh, Look at the science, and and the science doesn't lie. So really examine that. Spend some time examining the science, and uh, then decide for your own. I think that's the whole point, is for people to come to the realization on their own, because we can't tell them what to think. We can just present the material, present the science, and we hope that people uh, you know, take that and, and do something with it. That's you know, that's the goal. That's the that's the aim here. 
Good advice for life, you cannot control what other people do or think. You have no power over that whatsoever. Stop trying, give up, don't even bother. All you can control is your own reaction to it, your own reaction to the world. But when you realize that, you, you have tremendous power because uh, if you you know if you cease to care about all those things and controlling everything else, then uh, sometimes you can lead by example and people will follow it. So yeah, let's do that. Let's have a big flood of people run for Congress, uh, pledge to uh, to uh, focus on the Bobby McIlvain Act, uh, the World Trade Center evidence in their campaigns, and we'll we'll all do it together. But I want I want other people doing it out there as well because we need to be the change that we want to see in this world that's the only way it happens and don't be intimidated don't think that you can't do it out there trust me i've seen what's out there representing us you can certainly do a heck of a lot better a better job than they can um it's not exactly america's best and brightest out there so uh kamal i'd like to know from you uh, what are some of the other things that people can be doing? Let's say they decide to buy up some of the materials in the sale, you know, and I want to say to the audience too, you don't need to have a plan in mind right now. Just get your hands on it and then maybe the plan will come. I knew a guy who had like a whole trunk full of AE materials. He opens it up. It's like he's got an arsenal in there. It was uh, very impressive. But um, what are some of the things that they can do once they've got those evidence cards, once they've got uh, books and such. You, you mentioned parties and, and things. Uh, give our audience some other ideas. Well, that's really a, a great question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the getting involved is really so important. Uh, whether you, you keep uh, organizing um, uh, your local groups uh, to basically uh, put put out some uh, bring uh, ask us for help and we can help uh, make presentations uh, whatever your your group decides to put something together would be happy to to provide support um, of course we if if it's too hard to get involved if it's too if you can't spend the time. And, and your time is so precious, and we know your time is so precious. And um, we we always would be so appreciative of your of your donations as well. So donations is we survive completely on donations. We do our work completely on donations. We have a, a staff of mostly volunteers, and and uh, the rest of the staff have have dedicated their their uh, life to this and they they're, they're just being paid way under market for what they do and they do an incredible job um, and I'm talking about uh, you know who the staff is but um, but anyway so a, a big portion of our group our volunteers the engineers that go around doing PDD presentation project due diligence presentations and and that's an incredible project too I want to put a plug for it as well because it, it is we see that major change will occur when the engineering community uh, achieves the critical mass that that are, that is asking for a, a, a renewed a relook at the 9-11 building failures so um, if you're an engineer we ask you also to basically help us get the word out and we are we will provide the the uh, material we will provide the the uh, manpower to basically make presentations so um that's another angle but for for the general public who are not engineers the engineering part of it may be a little too mundane uh, then i think just basically getting involved um and and if if you don't have time to get involved uh, donations are so appreciated and you, you are our lifeblood uh, to basically keep doing the work that we do yeah that's right you know there's a lot of uh, bad apples out there trying to trying to muddy the waters and make these claims or whatever but we are really a bare bones organization uh, we are we're not a, a corporate 
entity as, as some people want to claim. I mean, it, at one point our main office was a, I think it was like a two bedroom apartment. And uh, we had a couple of people even, you know, spending the night there and stuff. At one point I slept in the storeroom just to run our store. So, uh, you know, anything that people can do to help, um, you know, is appreciated. And uh, we got to keep the lights on on this thing because they are trying to distract us. And, you know, people get this false perception uh, about progress because they're so used to the cable news model of following everything up to the minute on the issues that the system has designed or has decided uh, should be first and foremost. So, you know, the stuff going on with Trump right now, you know, you get you hear him say something and then you hear the opposing side say something and it's all up to the minute and every kind of development you're getting right there, right in your face as it happens or delivered to your phone. But, you know, there's things that happen also behind the scenes and progress me uh, that we can measure that uh, you aren't necessarily hearing about. And sometimes we can't always talk about it either. Uh, but that's how it's always been throughout history. I mean, the abolitionist movement was a very slow process starting out in churches and such. And, you know, they didn't have the kind of media uh, back then that we do now. So you didn't necessarily hear about all of the developments and things taking place. But at one, you know, at a, at a certain critical mass point, it had an effect and there was a, a civil war that came as a result of all of those efforts that happened there. So it was never a very pleasant thing uh, up until the end when they finally reached their, their final goal. But there was, you know, some very dark things that happened along the way as well. That's what happens. And, you know, with our issue, and I got to watch how I say this because I'm doing the podcast and on camera right now, but, you know, we are digging up the septic system of America with the World Trade Center issue. Of course, we're going to get some of it on us. That's just what you can expect. So we, we know that, right? And so there's going to be pushback. There's going to be resistance. And we are going to face difficult times. But we have time and time again. God, God, I've been here right you know, for a very long time. I feel like an ancient mariner with scars down my face from everything I've seen. Nothing even pants me or worries me anymore. We're going to do that, but we will get through. And I am confident at some point this will be acknowledged. There will be a big focus on September 11th again. Once the stuff that's distracting everybody dies down, um, and uh, I, I want everybody to uh, stick with it and uh, join us at the end of this journey, and I know it will be fulfilling for everybody that has been involved. And we know who they are, and we appreciate them, and uh, just uh, stay with us another a little while longer is an essential message because there are big things going on right now behind the scenes. Uh, anything to add to that, Kamal? No, I think you said it very eloquently. <laughs> I, I don't think I can add anything to that. All right. And another reason to donate is help me buy a new chair because this, oh, there you this go. is not going <laughs> to... Yeah, exactly. This is uh, not going to fly for much longer. But, uh, all right. So I guess in the final uh, few minutes here, uh, you would mentioned the threat of nuclear war. We, we're not an alarmist show. I don't want to go on that model where we're scaring people and then, you know, <laughs> saying donate to us because the world is going to end tomorrow. But I know that sometime whenever all of that started, I did have a very real concern and I'm no geopolitical expert. Uh, nobody ever thinks anything's going to happen until it actually happens and all of a sudden their jaws drop and they have nothing to say. But uh, this is the closest that we've come to a situation like that in my lifetime. Uh, I think that our issue, focusing on that, helps fight the tide of some kind of potential really bad outcome for the world uh, on that level with the stuff that's going on with Russia and whatnot. Um, so that's why it's so important to me. By focusing on the World Trade Center evidence, we impact other issues. We put that seed of doubt in people's minds and then they question other things. In your view, Kamal, last few minutes, why is this issue still important to you? Well, I mean, as I said, I said that now we're looking at the threat of nuclear war. We're looking at a major geopolitical mess that I think, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're a historian or if you have, have studied politics, you can see that basically how things evolved since 9-11. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so important because it really started. I mean, it, it was brewing up to the point of 9-11 that was about... It happened, and 
I guess there was a plan. Uh, you know why that happened, and uh, and it, you know it's just it's, it just seems to have whether people like it or not. It's not like a master plan or anything, but whether people like like it or not, we've put ourselves in a box. It seems we've put ourselves deliberately in a box because we figure that we want to be tough, we want to act tough. Um, the 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 strange thing about it is that what brings us here today is is posturing and and basically um, challenging uh, other countries as a result of, of you know saying that basically um, you know we're, we're it, it, our national security is just so important that we need to start attacking other countries or uh, creating uh, creating unrest in other countries in order to protect ourselves from potential terrorism. I mean, that's really the crux of everything that's happening nowadays. It may seem, for, for some people, it may seem, oh, you're, you're just a conspiracy theorist talking about these things, but when, uh, as a, when, if, if you look at history and how things develop over the years, and we're going into a collision course and I, I think, I mean, it's not too, it, it's the interesting thing is not, it's not necessarily a deliberate plan. What it, it, it's an inadvertent result of basically uh, neglecting, uh, the, you know, certain situations, the parts of history that happened that brought us here today and re-examining those things because uh, once those are re-examined and understood, then we can understand why this is happening today. So that's why everything is so relevant and it's going to continue to be relevant until, who knows, until maybe things change uh, on a drastic scale where we're no longer hell-bent on being a, a warring country. Uh, and and basically, we we change our, our um, approach to world politics by actually um, helping people instead of, you know, overthrowing governments and 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 uh, interfering with other people's uh, other countries' elections, with uh, creating coups around the world, and 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 just uh, under the guise of of national security, which is really you know that's what 9/11, the the outcome of 9/11 is all about. So that's why it's so relevant. All right, and I would love to see the world get into a state where it doesn't have to be as vigilant anymore. People can focus on making their own lives better. Art, beauty right. become the main focus instead of whatever drama the television has everybody dialed into and getting at each other's throats over. That would be a beautiful day, and I think 9-11 Truth can get us there. So, Kamal, thank you for all the work that you're doing here at AE 9-11 Truth. I see it behind the scenes. And, of course, thank you for coming on 9-11 Free Fall today. Well, thank you, Andy. I should thank you for all the work you're doing. You're, you've dedicated your life to this cause. And uh, I can't think of anyone uh, that has uh, been so dedicated and so... Uh, you've, you've basically sacrificed so much for what you're doing. Well, so we're, you. we're just getting started, folks. This is just the beginning of the story. Wait till we get to the end of it. And we have the justice.